So anyway, I played a move which is fourth down on the Ribka list, Queen G8. So it's still got some, some nasty threats. I'm threatening just to drag this pawn one square forward. So after bishop f6, I do drag the pawn one square forward. And um, I think it's getting difficult for him to play um, queen e5 again now. Um, although that is Ribka's uh, recommendation. So look at this again now. Queen e5, check, king d8. And here, now queening this pawn is, is winning the rook, because queen takes f3. So that's a useful pin. And uh, so the pawn again is a decoy for, for disrupting um, black's pieces and protection of key points. So um, after h7, he plays actually queen e2. And even s I now saw a winning, clearly winning continuation. Check. And now just rook takes d6. No dangerous checks to contend with here. And he has to defend d7 somehow. He defends it by blocking with his bishop, which allows me to just simply queen the pawn. He's only got about two minutes left on his clock at this stage, by the way. King c7, I just take on d7. And rook queen h to e8. And finally he resigns. So quite an entertaining game last night. Um... Thank you for putting me in, in a good spirits before the game. I was, I was chuckling to myself in the car about um, my Microsoft Agent annotation. I, I have to reassure you that there are quite a lot of good annotations on Let's Play Chesscom, but um, I'll read them out myself next time, or make sure the text-to-speech technology is quite good <laughs> before I unleash the agent. Let's have a look at this game again. Um, very tactical, sharp game. And I think this is what fighting chess is all about, you know, casting on opposite sides. By the way, I think um, Lauren da Costa, who recently got a GM norm, is writing a book specifically on the theme of games where both sides are castling on, on the other wing. So that should be an exciting book um, to read. So Lauren da Costa, you know, the top player in the Hertfordshire League, which I play for the Barnet Chess Club. Um, so the Muzzle Hill, this is in the Middlesex League, by the way. And so far this season, um, I'm on minus one in the Middlesex League. I have shared um, two of my uh, losses. I think the worst crush was against Perkins in the King's Engine. But um, I had good chances in another game. I was bishop up. And um, you saw the IM draw that I missed from last time. So I've lost three. I've won two so far. And I've drawn two. So I'm minus one for Muswell Hill in this league. Anyway, so after Knight takes D4... Bishop takes d4, um, knight e5. So let's see. So this attack was kind of um, logical, these pawns um, uh, getting very aggressive. It reminds me, I, I had this game against Morugan and Lloyd's Bat Masters where, um, from years ago. If white gets in you know, h5 and g6, just ripping open the lines, it doesn't matter if you lose a pawn because then you know, uh, there's so many threats against the black king. Um, so um, the idea is just, just to smash through the black king position. It's very crude, but effective stuff. Um, so h5. But, you know, he generated you know, some interesting counterplay, like you know, some of the GM games have shown, that this bishop coming to this important um, diagonal. And uh, so a lot of the tactics and counterplay he had were based on that. His idea of knight d4, by the way, if he's allowed to play knight b5, he'll be threatening knight a3. I wonder if actually that was um, as dangerous as it seemed. I'll just quickly give give white some null moves here. If this was really dangerous. So if I didn't take on b5, say, so say king a1 here, rook a c8, this, this would be kind of dangerous. So this is the kind of position to avoid, where this diagonal and, and other black um, resources are coordinating kind of well now. So rook f7, and it's even threatening like rook c7, so attacking and defending, defending g7, threatening, you know. So this is, this is the sort of thing which it shows it's not totally easy for, for white to play. White's got to be careful. So when I saw knight d4, I thought, yeah, during his time I'd seen that, you know, rook takes d4 would be a, a nifty move here. Just snapping up a pawn. The drag and drop tactic. So um, winning a pawn, but it wasn't the end of the story now. Still had to play accurately. 
And I played, you know, some safe moves, but uh, when you play safe moves, they're not necessarily the most accurate. So bishop d3, just trying to reinforce my centre, instead of this um, bishop c4 and f4 idea. So uh, bishop d3, bishop h8, so that's an inaccuracy. Uh, so rook d1, it's not a bad move, third on, on the ribka list. Rook f4. So my queen is now making its way to the, the queen side now. Again, missing the critical uh, line queen d2 and queen takes b4 immediately. So I'll try and play a bit safe, just, just reinforcing my centre. And uh, we see now the queen weaving its way from the queen side to the king side. So I pick up some more pawns. So three pawns up here. Um, thankfully I play uh, bishop b3. It's a shame that I missed queen g4 check, just picking up a whole rook. Um, so bishop b3 at least stops black's uh, potential draw by, by uh, this bishop takes c2. And um, now his position soon starts to fall apart after the decentralization. So getting more control of the center here and, and starting to drag the pawn forward one square has critical implications for, for disrupting um, black's protection of, of key squares and, and tactical liabilities start to um, emerge very clearly now after queen e2. So even I saw a winning continuation now, just rook takes d6. Nothing black can do here. Um, it seems um, no Rivka agrees that there's, there's, there's hopeless. So just queening the pawn, rook takes d7. I hope you enjoyed that game. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.